Hello and welcome to another session of weekly analysis of current events. So, like always, we'll be covering uh, the important news is and the UPSC level explanation of the uh, one week news. That's a previous year's uh, sorry, previous week's news. So, coming to the first topic from the history portion, that's a hundred death anniversary of Lokamanya Tilak. So, recently the uh, ICCR, that's the Indian Council for Cultural Relations, have conducted a webinar actually to observe the 100th death anniversary of Lokamanya Tilak uh, and that was on August 1st, 2020. So, talking about Tilak, he was born on 23rd July 1856 in Ratnagari, Maharashtra and he was a lawyer and he is popularly known as Lokamanya Tilak and he is famous for the slogan Swaraj is my birthright and I shall have it and he died on 1st August 1920 so he was an all in all in the Indian freedom struggle so we will be discussing about the main contribution of him in the freedom struggle so one of the earliest contribution was uh, the, he was one of the vocal uh, proponent for Swarajya then he was an active uh, member in Lal Bal Pal Trio that's an extremist group and again, uh, a, a book called as Indian Unrest was written by Valentin Shirol at that point of time. Uh, it was a uh, English journal. Uh, so in that, Tilak was uh, quoted as a father of Indian unrest. And then he joined Indian National Congress in uh, 1890. And he propagated Swadeshi and boycott movements. So later in 1916, he started Indian Home Rule Movement. And this is on the lines of Annie Besant's movement and uh, he actually found it in April 1916 at Belgaum. So it worked in Maharashtra basically but not in Bombay and also in central provinces in Karnataka and Bera. So it, it worked in Maharashtra, central provinces, Karnataka and Bera. Remember Bombay is not, not included in, the, uh, in this particular organization. So again in 1916 Lucknow Pact was signed between uh, INC, INC was headed by Tilak at that point of time and Muslim League led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah so it stood for Hindu-Muslim unity in the national struggle and again he ha had many newspapers Kesari, Kesari was in Marathi and Maharatha in, in English and he also wrote many books Gita Rahasya, Arctic that's a home of Vedas these are the books written by him so, the next topic is from polity, habeas corpus cases in Jammu and Kashmir. So, after the abrogation of uh, special status uh, of uh, Jammu and Kashmir in uh, August 2019, the High Court was confronted with an unprecedented number of habeas corpus petitions. Okay, around 250 petitions were filed. So, uh, after the abrogation of the special status, thousands of people were detained from uh, across Kashmir Valley under the preventive detention law. So, several hundreds were detained under the PSA law also. That's a public safety act. So, other preventive detention laws under which people were booked are uh, NSA, that's National Security Act of 1980s and UAPA, that's Unlawful Activities Prevention Act of 1967. So, these acts were prevalent. So, um, the, the habeas corpus that we are going to talk about, the records of cases dealt by High Court uh, was increased by 61 percentage uh, under this habeas corpus filing and uh, however 17 cases uh, in almost 17 cases the court squashed the detention orders because there was uh, no procedure okay so that is why no procedure because of this uh, PSA the public safety act so our point of concern here is the public safety act of 1978 so what is public safety act it is actually a preventive detention law and under this a person is taken into custody to prevent him or her from acting in any matter that is pre uh, pre prejudicial to the security of state or maintenance of public order. That means he's not done anything as of such 
but he may do anything against the law and order of that particular area so that is a preventive detention law and the the detention period will be up to 2 years and the enforcement it will be passed either by the divisional commissioner or the district magistrate and the only way uh, administrative preventive uh, detention order can be challenged is through a habeas corpus uh, petition okay it can be either filed by the the spouse or any relatives of the uh, people who are detained okay so the high court and the supreme court they both have the jurisdiction to hear the petitions and can uh, pass a final order seeking squashing of psa so if i am detained by uh, this psa and my family members file a habeas corpus if the court feel that it is not appropriate to um, actually uh, put psa on me then he can actually scrap it the the supreme court or the high court can scrap it however if the order is quashed there is no bar on the government passing another detention okay so uh, the next topic for discussion is constitutional uh, bench for ews quota so recently the supreme court of india referred the petitions challenging the 103rd constitutional amendment act to give a uh, to a five judge constitution bench saying that it involves substantial questions of law so according to this article 145 clause 3 of constitution at least five judges need to hear cases that involve a substantial question of law as to the interpretation of the constitution or if there is any reference to article 143 which deals with the power of president of india to consult the supreme court okay so the supreme court bench consists of at least 5 judges uh, that type of uh, bench is called as constitutional bench so it is saying that uh, according to this particular article 145 3 clause 3 a constitutional bench should be set up for the cases dealing with substantial questions of law understanding it so one uh, one third constitutional amendment act it actually introduced economic reservation 10 percentage quota in jobs and admission in uh, educational institutions for economical weak economically weaker sections so this was done by amending article 15 and 16 so new articles were inserted that is article 15 clause 6 and article 16 clause 6 was added so it was enacted to pro, uh, promote the welfare of the poor okay but who are not uh, covered under scsts or obc category fine so it will enable both the center and state to provide reservation for this particular category so what are petitioners saying that the amendment run contrary to the constitutional scheme uh, where no segment of available seats can be reserved on only on the basis of economic criteria that is the petitioners argument and it also uh, quotes the intra savni case of 1992 saying that a backward class cannot be determined only and exclusively with reference to the economic criteria and the amendments alter the 50% quota limit uh, set up in the intra savni case okay there there is like only 50% of the seats should be given under reservation that thing will be broken so what is the central government stand the amendment was necessitated to benefit this particular community ews who are not covered under existing scheme of reservation uh, so the 50% limit in intra savni case ruling cannot be applied in present petitions as the that particular case dealt with the memoranda issued by the government while what is under challenge now is a constitutional amendment okay that is the difference and that is a stand given by central government now we are going to deal a topic from governance uh, gramodyog vikas yojana so recently msme approved a program for uh, the artisan to make artisans to make uh, agarbatis okay under this particular scheme so we'll study what the scheme is so this is a yojana coming under uh, khadi gramodyog vikas yojana it is basically to uh, promote and develop the village industries uh through common facilities technological modernization training etc okay so the major components are research and development or the product innovation that would be given to the institutions that intend to carry out development or the new innovations or uh, design development etc so then there will be uh, agro based and food processing industry mineral based industry handmade paper industries everyone will be 
uh, you know uh, add up together to make a uh, village industry setup then there will be capacity building so in that the human resource development and the skill training components will also be included and in marketing and publicity the the villages will be providing marketing support by the uh, giving them a product catalog or the market research or new marketing techniques okay the next topic is one nation one ration card so recently manipur nagaland uttarakhand along with uh, ut of jammu and kashmir have been integrated in uh, onorc scheme so this scheme was uh, started as a uh, interstate portability of ration card in 2019 so you can use the ration card anywhere in the country that is the setup basically so it allows the migratory national food security act 2013 uh, beneficiary to lift their entitled quota of food grains from any fair shop okay any fair price shop of uh, their choice anywhere in the country so this can be done by using their aadhar identification so uh, with 24 states and uts connected under the scheme about 65 crore beneficiaries can be uh, benefited out of this uh, that means a- around 80% of the total beneficiary covered under nfsa okay national food security act now we'll see the international relations part so the first topic is operation breathing space this between india and israel so recently an israel team arrived in india with a uh, multi prolonged uh, mission uh, code named this operate uh, operation breathing space uh, for this covid-19 situation uh, talking about the news um, uh one cooperation is in the development of test kits so india's defense uh, research and development organization that is drdo and the israel's defense ministry research and development team they will be working together to develop four different kinds of rapid testing kit for covid-19 okay and this particular kit can give results within 30 seconds so they have also collaboration in various types of test like a audio test a breath test thermal test uh, poly amino test so in an audio test a person's voice would be recorded and evaluated through artificial intelligence and also the machine language so in breath test the the patient will uh, blow into a tube that will detect virus okay with this high frequency waves and then there will be thermal testing for uh, uh, actually identification of the virus in a saliva sample and also poly amino test uh, test uh, kits will be there to isolate the proteins related to covid-19 and there will be india specific approach as well the kits will be jointly developed uh, after the trials on the the indian patients okay so the test have already been tried on the israeli patient but yet to be done in india so other assistance like the uh, pro- providing robotic equipments wrist monitors that will also help the uh, doctors and nurses monitor a p- patient and the team also have brought around 83 advanced respirators to help patients with severe symptoms okay the next topic from uh, international relations is uh, quadrilateral dialogue that is between china nepal pakistan and afghanistan So recently China uh, conveyed a quadrilateral dialogue including all these countries. So they discussed about the four point plan. We'll discuss what the four point plan is about. China uh, proposed this four point plan to contain COVID-19 pandemic, also to boost the economy and also uh, you know betterment of the BRI Belt Road Initiative infrastructure projects. So the four uh, point plan includes to share the consensus in fighting the pandemics as good neighbors and also to learn from china and pakistan's joint prevention and control model of pandemic and to look at opening up green channels as soon as possible by the four countries so the green channel what is green channel it is basically a route uh, followed in passing through the customs in an airport uh by the passengers claiming to have uh, no dutiable goods to declare okay pakistan nepal and afghanistan actively supported the four point cooperation initiative proposed by china 
Next topic is Beirut uh, ex explosion. So, a massive explosion took place in Beirut. That's the capital of Lebanon. And around 4,000 people are injured and more than 100 people are dead. So, uh, there were two explosions in the central port area of Beirut. And uh, actually, the blast uh, was affected by people even around 10 kilometers. And there was also an earthquake around 3.3 magnitude. And you know, around 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate was triggered and um, this is what led to the explosion. Okay, so what, what happened uh, after the blast? Lebanon is basically an import dependent country. So, this badly damaged port facility in Lebanon's largest maritime gateway will make uh, uh, the essential items more expensive and it will also threaten the food security in the country. And Lebanon has already been struggling with a huge economic meltdown with this rapid devaluation of local currency and this uh, volatile exchange rate on black market fueling inflation shuttering business and unemployment and poverty so um, this can be a, a major blow to the overall economy of uh, lebanon and uh, the ammonium nitrate that we are talking about is a nitrogen rich white crystalline chemical which is soluble in water so the major use of uh, ammonium nitrate the major use is it is an agricultural fertilizer and it is also an ingredient for the production of uh, anesthetic gases and cold packs. And it is also the main ingredient of manufacture of commercial explosive. These explosive can be used in mining and construction activities. Okay, so as explosive, it is a main component of the, uh, you know, ammonium nitrate fuel oil. It is commonly known as ANFO. Okay, so pure ammonium nitrate is not an explosive on its own, but it will be explosive or it, uh, it can be made as a detonator like RDX or TNT if required. Okay, and many improvised explosive devices used by terrorists around the world have ANFO in it. That is the main component. So stored ammonium nitrate is a fire hazard and it can explode in two ways like one it may come in contact with some explosive mixture and then it can explode or due to oxidation process at a large scale so the heat may be generated starting a fire and then explosion so there were many explosions in the past also because of the ANFO. Uh, one such is uh, the Pulwama, uh, Pulwama, then Varanasi, Malaga, and Pune, Delhi, Hyderabad, Mumbai. So, all these areas, the explosive like RDX were used. And there have been accidents, explosion of ammonium nitrate also in uh, China in 2015, also in Texas in 1947. So, this is like a major explosive if not contained properly we have many regulations also so it is classified as an oxidizing agent of grade 5.1 globally under united nations so this is actually a dangerous good under united uh, nations and the united nations committee of experts on transport of dangerous goods has categorized the types of dangerous goods uh, under nine classes like the explosive materials, inflammable liquids, easily oxidizing content. So, this is one of the dangerous goods coming under United Nations. In India also, it is coming under the rules called as Ammonium Nitrate Rules of 2012. And there is another act called as the Explosive Act of 1884, which defines ammonium nitrate as a compound formula, including any mixture or compound having more than 45% ammonium nitrate as explosive. Okay, so the storage of ammonium nitrate in large quantity in the populated area is illegal in India. Fine. And talking about Lebanon, Lebanon is a country in West Asia bordered by Syria to the north uh, and east and Israel to the south while Cyprus lies in the west across the Mediterranean Sea. So, it was earlier con conquered by Ottoman Turks. You, you know the story, right? So, um, the after empire co collapsed after World War I, it came under the control of Fer French and they gained independence from French. Okay, so read about Lebanon. The next topic is from economics, that's a fiscal deficit. So, 
uh, as per the official data, the center's fiscal deficit for the first three months of 2020-21 was 6.62 lakh crore, which is like 83% of the budgeted tra- target for the year. So, uh, what economists are saying that the fiscal deficit may end up as high as 8% of the GDP. Uh, so, our goal is to keep it within 3.5%. So, it may go beyond 8, 8%. That is what economists are Say so the government described physical deficit of India as the excess of total disbursement from consolidated fund of India, excluding the repayment of debt uh, over uh, total receipts into the fund during a financial year. Basically, that's a total expenditure of the government uh, that is the capital expenditure plus the revenue expenditure. And take the total income of government, that is uh, the revenue uh, receipts and the recovery of loans and other receipts. Whichever amount of money is coming to the government is reduced from the expenditure of the government. So, whatever you have and what is coming to you, understanding it, it's like how much you spent and how much is coming to you. When the expenditure is actually... uh, overriding the revenue that is coming to us that means there is a physical deficit okay next is a core sector uh, industries so the output of eight core sector industries contracted for the fourth consecutive year that uh, consecutive month that is why it is in news so you know what is core uh, sector industries they are basically coal crude oil natural gas Refinery products, fertilizers, steel, cement and electricity. As you know, you have to learn that, um, uh, you know, contribution level. So, who, which uh, industry is the most contributing industry? You have to uh, actually study the the order. So, the most contributing industry will be refinery and uh, refinery products followed by electricity, electricity followed by steel, then coal, crude oil then natural gas, cement and then fertilizer. So, remember that um, order. So, these 8 industries together contribute around 40.27 percentage to the index of industrial production. So, what is index of industrial production? It is an index that shows the growth rate in different industry groups of the economy for a fixed period of time. Okay, so this particular IIP is compiled and published by National Statistical Office. Very important. National Statistical Office under Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. So, um, these can be mainly broadly classified as mining, manufacturing and electricity. Okay. The next topic is coming from environment that the investment to reduce plastic waste in India so, a Singapore-based uh, NGO uh, named Alliance to End Plastic Waste, they have in, uh, er, plans, uh, plans to invest around 70 million US dollars uh, in India over the next five years to remove plastic from our country. So, uh, the point of concern here is we have to learn about various initiatives of this particular uh, NGO across the globe. So, that is the only thing we have to concentrate here. So, they have... Um, Uh, Other initiative like the World Nature Conservation Day, which is announced on uh, 28th July. So, we have like um, 28th July uh, announced as a World Nature Conservation Day. So, every year we are celebrating that. And then they have uh, Project Aviral. Project Aviral is aiming to reduce plastic waste in Ganga River. Then there is another uh, uh, mission or another program of them, UN Habitat Waste Wise Cities. So, uh, they are collaborating with UN Habitat to implement solution towards a uh, good economy uh, and also resource recovery. Okay, UN Habitat Waste Wise Cities. It is together UN Habitat and the Alliance to End Plastic Waste doing this job. Then they have another plan like Zero Plastic Waste Cities Initiative. So, they are doing it in India and Vietnam in order to abate the plastic problem. That's the same thing. Okay, it is mainly concentrating in the ocean. Fine. So, the four programs of uh, this Alliance to End Plastic Waste are World Nature Conservation Day, Project 
Avirar, then UN Habitat Waste Wise Cities and the Zero Plastic Waste Cities Initiative. Okay. The next topic is Iravikulam National Park. So recently, very recently, landslides have been reported in this particular area. So uh, in the T estate uh, at Pettimudi, uh, it is in Munar and it is very adjacent to the Iravikulam National Park in Kerala. So, uh, talking about the area, it's high ranges. It is called as Kannan Devan Hills. Okay. So, it's a, it is in the southern western guts in Devikulam Taluk of Idiki district. So, um, the Rajamalai Hill, uh, the region of the park, it stays open to the public for tourism. Everybody knows that because of uh, the Nilakurinyi flowering. And uh, this Eravikulam Rajamala Wildlife Sanctuary was declared in 1975 and then it became a national park in 1978. So the main body of the park, it, it has a, a rolling plateau uh, with a base elevation of 2000 meters from the mean sea level. So what is a rolling plateau? Rolling plateau means the plateau level is different. It's like different heights, varying heights. Okay, so three major type of plant communities can be seen in Eravakulam National Park. That's grassland can be seen, shrublands can be seen and also shola forest. Shola forests are nothing but uh, montane forest. Okay, temperate forest and grasslands. Fine. So, um, it also houses the Nilakurinyi flowers and the Nilgiri Thar. Fine. And there are other animals also like Nilgiri, Martin. Then you have dusky stripped squirrels and uh, the rivers, actually the catchment areas of river Pambar and uh, river Periyar and Chalakudi rivers are the main rivers to be uh, quoted. And uh, there are also many uh, other wildlife sanctuaries in the nearby area like Chinnar Wildlife Sanctuary, Anamudi Shola National Park, Pambadam Shola National Park, Kurinyimala Sanctuary and uh, Anamalai Tiger Reserve. Now, coming to the science and technology portion, the first topic is Beidou Navigation Satellite System. So, as the name suggests, it is of China. So, China has formally launched full global services of Beidou 3 uh, Navigation Satellite System, BDS. So, uh, what is this? This is actually uh, the navigation satellite system which is completed in three states. The first state was BDS-1, then, then BDS-2, uh, that service... Uh, so, it was like the BDS-1 provided services for China, BDS-2 provided uh, the services for Asia Pacific and BDS-3 will be providing services for the worldwide, okay, for the entire world. So, a hybrid constellation consisting of around 30 satellites uh, <coughs> will be sent to the orbit. So, three kinds of orbits will, will be used. That's a geostationary Earth orbit, inclined geosynchronous orbit and the medium Earth orbit will be used for this purpose. So, uh, it will actually provide multiple frequencies of so more clarity will be there and it will also offer accurate positioning, navigation and timing, short messaging communication, international search and rescue and satellites, uh, satellite based augmentation, ground augmentation, precise point positioning. So, these are the, uh, the major takeaways from this particular mission. Okay, so other countries are also having this particular uh, satellite system. The satellite system of USA is called as GPS. Russia's is known as GLONASS and European Union's is known as Galileo. And India also have it now. India's name, uh, name is IRNSS, shortly no known as NAVIC. So Indian um, regional navigation satellite system uh, was uh, you know given the operational name of navic or navigation with indian constellation this is a regional satellite navigation system of india so it is launched and operated by isro and it can actually cover a region of 1500 uh, kilometer of uh, around india so india and surrounding of 1500 kilometers so seven active satellites were sent into the geostationary orbit, uh, three were sent to the geostationary orbit and four were sent to the inclined geosynchronous orbit. This was a previous year question. Okay. Now, the last topic for today's discussion is Bharat Air Fiber Wireless Internet. 
So, Bharat Air Fiber Services have been inaugurated at Ecola in uh, Maharashtra, providing the residents wireless internet connections on demand. So, the Bharat Air Fiber Services are introduced by uh, BSNL. So, this will be a part of the Digital India Initiative by Government of India and it is done on a pan-India basis. Okay, so what they are doing is they are providing fiber to home, that is FTTH wireless connectivity up to a range of 20 kilometers from BSNL points of presence. So, the connectivity speed will be 100 Mbps and BSNL will be providing broadband plans. So, why they are doing it? Because the COVID-19 has created a situation where people have to work from home, students have to learn uh, from home through e-learning. So, there is a high demand of uh, internet at home. So, it will support e-learning, online shopping, gaming and entertainment amidst this lockdown issues. Okay, so that's all for today. If you have any doubts, please feel free to comment it in the comment section. Thank you so much. Thank you.